What's up, Soggy Pits? Hello, hello, hello. Let's see if we can get this in focus. How's everybody doing today? Uh, I Let me get this out of here. Let me mute my phone. As we're waiting for people, we're waiting for people. All right, we got two people in here right of, as of now. Let's see if we can get a couple more before we start going. How's everybody doing tonight? Hey, Betsy, what's up? Soggy Pits, what's up? Um, just, uh, basically this is a bit of an impromptu cast. I, I'm still figuring out, uh, when to broadcast. So in the comments after this stream, Bob, what's up? I'm glad that you can make it, sir. Um, in the comments after this stream, if you could just say when would be a good time for me to cast, let me know because there's a lot of fish channels now and they cast pretty much every day of the week. So depending on who you're into, uh, it varies quite a bit. Uh, the main crew that's kind of uh, seems to be linked up with me is, uh, you know, um, uh, Aquarium Co-op, uh, Rachel, O'Leary, um, uh, Lucas Brett, Bob Steenfot, Rob from Flip Aquatics, and... Uh, I don't know, Aqua, I don't know if Mike from Aquapros has like a set time or anything, and then Joel. So those are the ones that like I'm always bumping into and trying not to overlap with. What's up, Mark Parrish? Welcome. Um, but yeah, if you have a time and day that like really works for you, if I see a pattern, that's I'll, I'll do that. Like, uh, but right now it's been a little bit. I've had a lot of jobs that are uh, side jobs and stuff, and so. I've just had weird hours, and right now, my wife's out of town for the weekend, and I'm just hanging out alone, so I was like, you know what, let's do a live cast tonight, and I was talking with Betsy, and we were chatting about what things people would like to hear about, and um, anytime I'm not competing with other folks, you say go for it, Betsy. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Pretty much right now, usually Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays have been the days that I've tried it out, and usually in the afternoon Pacific time, but we also have a lot of followers in Singapore and London, UK, the Netherlands. Laura with an O, hello, hello, welcome, come on in, but don't close the door on your way in. Uh, but... Yeah, so whatever day works best, let me know, you guys. So tonight is kind of an impromptu one, and I wanted to talk about uh, what Betsy suggested, actually, which was the uh, raising and caring for the preparation for fry. And that's a really big topic, and I'll get more into it in other videos in the future. Uh, but basically... Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to talk about a couple different setup styles of how you can raise fish, how I'm raising fish, what I'm raising right now, and then if you guys have questions about situations you guys are breeding fish, let me know because I've bred a lot of different fish since the last 20 years, just off and on keeping random things, and I've also witnessed friends uh, breeding stuff in their setup, so I have a fair amount of exposure um can endlers and guppies crossbreed question coming in the first question of the night let me answer that question with this so uh this tank so we've got a japanese blue endler here and we've got guppies galore these are all um, almost all female guppies in here this is a guppy this is a rainbow guppy uh, rainbow snake skin and I've put them all together so that they can make babies and right now in this tank we have these babies these are the newest that one back there is the newest hatchlings those ones are were born this week whereas then there's some older ones here and then there's even older ones yet here so uh, yes, they can cross and they will cross. And so if you don't want them to cross, be careful. Now, while I'm at this tank, I wanted to talk about, uh, breeding rainbow fish. That's what this little gal is right here. This is a, whoa, she's swimming right towards us. Uh, this is a dwarf neon rainbow fish, female, and she is an accident. 
in that her parents were upstairs. I gave away her parents, and I actually, when setting up this tank, I put in uh, different floating plants, and I think the real cul culprit was the, the hornwort. But that served as a mop, and so come about, I don't know, a week or two later, there's these itsy-bitsy little fish, teenier than guppy fry, that hatch, and in with these guppies, I didn't afford them special protection because I didn't know what they were. I thought they were snail eggs on there at first, and uh, basically they ended up hatching out, and there were probably a dozen of them for a few days uh, at the size that I noticed them. They were so small, they were hard to see, actually. And uh, out of all of them, one survived uh, the, the gauntlet of catfish and uh, guppies and all sorts of things. But it just goes to show you that in any tank, in theory, you can raise and breed uh, fish. That's not optimal. Like, granted, if I'd wanted to be raising rainbow fish, what I would have done is I would have taken a tank, and this is true for many, many species. If you have a question about a certain species, let me know, because I'm also going to talk about a species that I'm raising up fry right now. Um, but basically, <clears throat> you would clear out this whole tank I like 20 breeders, 20 longs. Uh, it gives them room to swim. It has good uh, surface area to water ratio because it's not that tall. And so it, it ends up having lots of areas for good bacteria, especially if you put a little bit of something in there. So a lot of times I'll put a few logs or, or you know, spider wood or something in there and a sponge filter because that's more area for good bacteria. You have to clean it less. And then a lot of times, see this like power head up here? I'll point the power head down below and have it going up and then I'll have a hang off the back running, which isn't running right now, just the sponge filter is. But I will do the hang off the back filter for when I'm uh, just going through the egg laying process. So that means there's nothing in a tank other than some pieces of wood, the sponge filter, the power head, and the hang off the back going. And so the hang off the back is going to get debris so there doesn't there isn't poo for the w weeks that sometimes it takes to get something to lay eggs. And then the wood, the glass, or you can use a mop. And mops are a whole subject I could do a whole thing on because um, there's a long history of creating different mops from different things. But basically a mop you can make out of acrylic wool and you can cut it, like cut short strands, yay big up to a foot long depending on your tank. And you just let that build uh, like a ball of it. And then you have maybe 40 to 100 strands hanging down. And you put that in the corner and it simulates grass. And then each day you can pull it apart and kind of see if there's little clear white eggs in it. And uh, usually they'll lay in there. And you don't want it so dense that they can't swim through that. Um, but the other way to do it is if you cleared out all the species in the tank, you could just leave it as a scape tank and just naturally they're gonna lay eggs, especially with certain species. Rainbow fish, uh, peacock gudgeons are another one I've raised successfully, Corydoras I've raised, but they usually want some sand. And so there's different tricks for different species. Feel free to ask questions if you have a species that you're curious about or thinking of raising. But basically, um, in this tank, I'm using it as a grow out tank and then a hatchery for guppy endler hybrids. So that's the deal in here. And the question was, do guppies and endlers mix? And yes, they do. This is a result of them mixing. Come on. And he is now old enough that he's showing off trying to mate also. And here is another one. This was a bluegrass guppy mixed with that father that we, I just showed. And that you see has more of a guppy elongated shape rather than the little, uh, the male having kind of a, a belly and uh, having a belly and then the long fin. So you can see that the, the two that are more of the blue endlers, they do have uh, guppy genes in them almost, oh, let me stop short before I say that, but most 
Endlers have a little bit of guppy gene in them, just in the trade, because at some point they've been crossed with something, uh, and at different points in time it's been argued that they are uh, separate species or the same species that's just diverged. So I think where they stand on that is basically what is your definition of a species, because all of these came from Molly's, Platy's, Swords, and about three other species, all came from the same common ancestor and genetically they broke off at different times. So if you think the endlers have been separate long enough to be their own species, then they're their own species. If you want to say that, you know, sharing 20% of the DNA, um, basically, you know, that that's not enough. I mean, we share 98 point some percent of DNA with, uh, great apes. I mean, we share 95% DNA with friggin' mice, so, and bananas, and all sorts of weird things you wouldn't expect. Just life on Earth shares a lot of DNA. So it gets down into the DNA that expresses itself as a phenotype, and a phenotype means what you're looking at. So pheno, P H E N O, versus geno. Geno is the genes, pheno is the look. And a lot of times you can have uh, expressions when you're breeding. So say this rainbow snake skin looks like it's a rainbow and it's got dots and kind of that pattern. Or this endler here has the blue, green, and yellow. And it has some dots on it too. So those dots are left over from the wild. Uh, usually they have some dots. But those uh, the, the liar tail, the split tail is definitely not a wild trait that was bred in most likely from a guppy and that's probably why that strain could even be as much as half guppy and then once they get that trait then they'll try to breed it and stabilize the the result um betsy says i've bred dogs both ways one litter on phenotype and two litters on genotype with similar ancestors yeah so um you know what i'm gonna i have a, a, a wild idea so bear with me um let me grab a pen and we're gonna do something a little different if i can find the the right pen that i had set aside in my bedroom you're getting a sneak peek at my dark bedroom uh, which my wife said don't ever put on the live stream. So maybe you can see some of it, maybe not. Uh, let me go upstairs and look for uh, the proper penage. Um, but yeah, so that's going on in that tank. Uh, well, with crooked spine of that female p pass on, or was she? Oh, was she in an accident? Uh, yeah, that guppy had an accident. Um, no, that. That guppy didn't have enough calcium as a young guppy. This is the same litter right here, um, under a better light, uh, as the snakeskin rainbow downstairs. Um, but somebody, uh, Betsy says, this is why I like your streams. You always have something different to share. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll give it a shot in a minute here, but I just thought I'd show you this. I get sidetracked, and I'm like, let's show you more Endlers and Guppies side by side. So these are Endlers and Guppies. This is an actual wild-type uh, Endler right here, So or pretty close. So this one, let's get it to focus. Focus, focus, come on. Uh, so that, that three-dot Endler is a wild endler that has mutated so there's supposedly no guppy in its strain and that's a full-grown male compared to the size of the other ones here's another one down here uh so i just thought i would show you their size in comparison uh also the ones that have been hiding i've been talking about in other feeds so here is one of the plecos in my high-tech tank um I've been pulling algae like a mother. Um, and then the other pleco is almost certainly back in there. But that's for another time. Let me get back on track to what I was going to do. So, um, oh, here we go. I found it. Okay. So, I guess I can do it on this tank over here. It doesn't really matter which tank I do it on. So, we'll look at these guys too. Because this is 
Endlers that I am raising, if you saw the video today, this guy is in heat. Now guppies and endlers are almost always in heat, but this guy in, for, in particular is uh, on a... Something made him real frisky. I put in... Um, I put in green uh, rasboras, neon green rasboras, and also put in... What was the other thing I put in there with them? Uh, oh, a couple more ruby tetras. And that, for some reason, sparked him into being more uh, territorial, and now he's been on a quest to mate with all five of the female guppies, and I, he's going to get tired. I'm worried about him getting too tired because he's been showing off and posing since yesterday. He hasn't really stopped, and that takes a lot of energy out of them, uh, and I've had guppies and endlers actually die from that, and that's why they recommend having trios when you're when you're breeding. So you want at least two or three females to a male, and then that way usually the male is the aggressor in the relationship, but sometimes the females will bug the males, uh, but usually it's a male relentlessly uh, bugging females, and he can't make up his mind. I uh, wanted to say this tiger endler here is a rainbow tiger endler. Uh, the genes were edited by Lucas Bretz, but it's a good example. So let's, let's, I'll, we'll use him. Oh, wow, you're getting a good show too. Um, also, I wanted to mention, I've got purple diatome algae on the rocks, and I don't know where it came from, and it's not in any of my other tanks. I've never had it before, but I really like it, and I'm going to let it chill. <laughs> Even though there's a little bit of black uh, beard algae growing on there, uh, the little shrimp and things actually seem to keep it down somewhat. So I'll have to investigate. If anybody knows what that purple algae or uh, might even be a cyanobacteria is, let me know. So this guy has rainbow endler genes. So he's got blue on his tail currently. But you can see there's a patch of red, a streak of red in the center of his tail. Um, uh, it's diatome algae, I think, or cyano. It's been in there for a while. It was green, and then this red started taking over, and then now it's all the way to a purple or burgundy color. And there's other algaes mixed in. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, this is... My first aquascape that was uh, Iwagumi style, so predominantly rocks. And I just need to trim this down a little bit. But in here, there are 30 species of plants. And so instead of doing uh, an all the same carpet, this is kind of my horticultural selection. We've got everything from boosts to, uh, I don't know, seven kinds of crypts, uh, red ram's horn snails, uh, temple plant, lots of stuff going on. But So let's talk about phenotype versus genotype when you're breeding. So intentional breeding, we're going to talk about endlers and guppies because they're, they're easy to breed. They uh, You look at them funny and they have had babies. So usually, let's talk about them. Oh my gosh, you know how hard it is to open a new pen with one hand? It's hard, hold on. <laughs> oh god. I didn't leave you guys, I swear. I'm just too weak to open a pen with my thumbs or it's too slippery. Uh, so, what we're going to make here is called a Punnett square. So, let's see. Can you guys see this? I'll try to make it so you can see it. So, got a Punnett square. This might be better to do just on paper, but... I like drawing on the fish tank, so whatever. So we've got, we're gonna do the simplest form, and rem this isn't uh, this isn't really how it is in in real life. It's not quite this simple usually, but say that tail could have been blue on him, the outside of it, or it could have been red. So we're gonna put a blue here, and red since it's not there let's do lowercase and that is what he has right now because it's showing a little bit but the blue is dominant so lowercase is 
uh, not dominant, it is uh, recessive, and the uppercase is, but you can use it for a simple one gene expression. Yeah, so this is a one gene expression chart as Betsy, as Betsy just mentioned. This is just showing you the theory. Really, to do this with guppies the way I used to do it when I did fancy guppy breeding is I would have probably eight rows and there's certain colors that are dominant and you can look that information up or at least you can do it yourself over the years and figure out for instance that like the the body color is going to be dominant yellow is going to be sub dominant always recessive recessive means that it doesn't come out in the genes unless both mom and dad have it and they express it so this guy right here Let's say that that is his type and he is going to have a baby with a female who has the same genes. So he can either pass down BB, which is blue, blue, and that's going to win out because it's blue. There's no chance of R. And those babies down the line will never have uh, red ever. So then he could also have blue, red or blue, red. And that means the blue is dominant, so the red gets ignored. But those babies end up like their parents, and that's the more common situation than the just blue. So then you've got the last square, which is R, R, if you can see that, R, R. And that's red, so there's no blue expression there, and that's when you end up with the red tail. Now, this works for human eyes, this works for various things, but there are more than one factor. So it's not just one gene that expresses itself. It could be that really what you're working with is a yellow, blue, and green uh, pigment. And so to get subtle colors like um, purple, that is a mix of the red gene and the blue gene and that right there tells you that there's a missing gene. Um, it's at least two. Yeah, oh, the eyes? Yeah, no, no, Betsy. The eye, human eyes is like, I think it's like six things go into it total. But, um, but yes. <clears throat> so, basically there's layers to color. But you can figure this out once you know the genes of your fish. And you can kind of figure it out sometimes. There's certain traits like the leer tail, I know, is a recessive trait. Because I will have a batch. So say you have, uh, let's just say for ease, you have 40 guppies. Then you'll know 10 may have that uh, liar tail, uh, the split tail. And the other 30 don't. And so you'll know that they they inherited that gene. Now, if 50% have split tails, you can assume that the, the gene is dominant, or if or uh, at least 50, if not 75%, or at least they're co-dominant genes. Uh, that gets more complicated, but we're going to keep this simple. Um, yes, each square, exactly, Betsy, has a 25% chance of happening. Uh, once the parents, so this is mom and this is dad here, and these are the genes. So the sperm and the egg combine and they're, they're putting a gene towards the baby. So this is the possible outcomes the baby could have. And so you're either left with the all dominant male or, or all dominant baby. Um, you know that something has happened. The math changes. Each square has, to, oh yeah. And so now let's say that we take, let's try it with a different one. So we, tr we take RR and we breed that baby with an R or a BR. So we breed that guppy, that red guppy, or red tailed guppy, I should say. So this is the outcome, that one quarter of the population. We breed it with the ones that are more common. So it's it's siblings in these two categories. So 50% of the fish. Now the hard part is you don't necessarily know which fish are out of 75% are just carrying the blue gene versus the red gene. Luckily in guppies frequently they will 
uh, partially show what they're expressing. So you'll see a hint of red or something like that, and that will let you know that part of that gene got expressed. But let's just uh, humor ourselves here. So we've got red, blue, red, blue, red, red, and red, red. So the next generation, we had a higher chance of having, you got a 50% chance. So tw 20 of the 40 babies in this litter a generation later. And generations are called uh, usually Fs. So it goes by F. 2, F1, F, that's a terrible F, F1, F2. And so a lot of times if you see someone saying, oh, it's an F5 generation, that means this, the, the, that generation is very stable. Um, so then you can figure out that from those 50% were that way, and th somebody had to figure out this a long time ago and backtrack and figure out that, uh, the fact that we have red, red, and red, red here, and they knew all the outcomes of the last batch, and they knew the parents, and so this is why you need like eight tanks if you really want to figure this out. It's because you want to take a chunk of the babies and you put them aside, but the best control, I think, is to take the parent, and I know it's gross, but you breed the parent with the baby, with one of the babies, because that's the control. You know what the parent's going to look like. Now, the hard part is you, and that's just for one generation, or maybe you skip a generation and do that to try to get those traits back in. Now, this is just for that blue tail. This, you have thousands of genes and say tail shape, that may have another one. And if we're going to talk about how this really looks, and I'm not going to do the whole thing, but oftentimes it'll be something more like this. Because you'll have multiple genes expressing, and you'll have like um, three, so it'll be like B, R, L, and then B, R, Y. And B, so it gets really complicated. You don't need to see all that because that's. That's uh, some next level stuff. But basically, if you don't want to just randomly breed colors of guppies, uh, that is what you need to do. And that's true for all fish. And that's why we pay more for purebred fish that we can trace the strain. And so because Lucas has bred this, this guppy for so long, he can predict what it will look like and it like over 90% come out like that, come out looking like this guy. Um, basically, you have a pretty good guess uh, of what genes are, are, are expressing themselves. And then you, all you need to do is cross him with... Um, all you need to do is cross him with some random one that has totally different traits just for fun. That's what I'm doing in the tank downstairs. So you totally mix them with say like a purple guppy with stripes or something or with polka dots or something. And then if you see that polka dots showed up, you can guess that polka dots are more dominant than stripes. Uh, and put that in your little log book. Also, while we're at this tank, I wanted to point out I got a zebra uh, auto sinkless. They're kind of hard to come by, at least in my area. I've never seen them in the shop before. And so they also had marbled ones. And I, I think this is a marbled one that's been selectively, uh, bred. Um, all right. So let me read some of the comments real quick. So, uh, Betsy says, it's funny. I studied this with Saluki. Uh, is it Saluki? Uh, the dog type? I guess I don't know how to pronounce it, but genetics, but I never thought to use it for fish, too. Um, Bob says, it was figured out long ago we had genetics pertaining to health conditions way back in the mid-70s in nursing college. Yep. Uh, cool. I didn't know the proper word for it. Bob, if I recall, it was plant. Yes. Yeah, so let me tell you that history if you guys want to know it. It was a man named Gregory uh, Salukis. Okay, Salukis. 
Uh, it was a man named Gregory Mendel, who was a monk in the UK, I believe. Either French or the UK. But he was a monk, and he had pea plants. And he had lots of time, because he was a monk, and monks don't party. And he had his pea plants, and they either had blue, yellow, white, or purple flowers, I think. And so he figured it out by doing the same thing. And luckily, pea plants were really, really simple. Uh, and so it was a one time, like, that's either going to express itself or not. And that was the end of that. Um, so Gregory Mendel. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Lara with an O. Laura with an O. God, my wife's name's Lara. Sorry. And she spells it like, well, I won't get into it. We'd argue forever if I if I did that in our marriage, um, but yeah. So Laura asks, and I'll reword it in a PC way, but don't worry, I don't care that you said it that way. Uh, what happens to the inbred babies? Like if you're breeding them with their parents, well, that's what's happened to a lot of fish. Is uh, especially fancy fish like guppies, discus, things like that they get bred with their parents all the time. It's called line breeding. And basically, how many generations can you go before it has health effects? Sometimes one. Other times, it can be a long time. But if you want to be a good breeder, you will be mixing your lines. So I, for instance, that's the reason I have that uh, new Endler upstairs from Lucas, is because I have my upper... Um, uh, I have my upper uh, colony going for new DNA that's many generations away from these guys down here, which are also leopard endlers, or I should say they're leopard endlers. I've changed them from tiger endlers to leopard endlers in most cases now. Some still have stripes, though. Um, but basically, yeah, so, and then here's another Endler. And so this one, I'm doing exactly what I talked about. And we have an orange stripe, electric stripe Endler. We have an all orange Endler in here with the start of a liar tail. And then we have what is called a blue sky Endler. Uh, where'd it go? And so I'm going to be experimenting with these Endlers to see if some of the females get pregnant, which traits are uh, dominant. So, um, yeah, but basically to ask, answer Laura's question, like this female here with the back, uh, it's, it's probably, or it's likely that g genetic defects are occurring within several generations. Now, they've found in humans specifically that actually you can reproduce with your cousins and it's not, for one generation anyways, it's not going to uh, cause birth defects. Brothers and sisters, that causes birth defects. Uh, not all the time, but it, it, ha it raises the, the chance like, you know, 20% or 50%. I don't know what the percentage is. It raises it some significant amount. And that's why they don't let people do it in America. So, yeah, but... To, to be straightforward with that question, yeah, you can't, you can't do it forever, and that's why you introduce new genes. And even if that's going and trying to find another breeder, like somewhere back in history, they had the same parents. But if they've been in separate lines for, you know, 10 years or something, and they, they've been bred separately, those genes will modify enough that they become distant cousins. And so that's why it is really good to do that. But it can and does frequently throw off the genes of what you were hoping for because there can be latent genes and sometimes different dominant or recessive genes that you weren't expecting. Um, so that's how that works. And sorry if you hear me gulping, it's Dr. Pepper time. Yeah, it's a huge argument in a lot of things. Uh, interesting that the gene uh, for scoliosis is, att is attached to the female gene in humans and guppies. Uh, Bob, what do you mean? I'm, I'm, 
I'm interested in that. So you're a nurse or were a nurse. Uh, interested that the gene for scoliosis is attached to the female gene in humans. Okay. Oh, it is in humans. Got it. So, and then it also is in guppies, clearly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... I didn't know that about humans, but yeah, that is interesting. And maybe it is so deeply embedded in the genetic history of living creatures that that's why you're seeing it uh, in females in both fish and humans. I mean, we're related somewhere, unless you're a creationist, but I don't have time to argue about that right now. The blue endler is beautiful. What's it called again? Uh, Bob, awesome. Thank you for your service as a nurse since 1978. We need more people that care and take care of one another. The world needs more love and care. That's for sure. Um, yeah, it's a Japanese blue endler. And right now that female, the only reason I know, whoops, the only reason I know that she is not an endler, she's a guppy and she's a bluegrass guppy. The only reason I know that is because of that yellow on her tail. All of the Japanese endlers, the females have clear tails with just a little bit of yellow to, to translucent color right at the start, whereas this one has yellow coming back like he does, ironically, but that is because I bred them a generation ago together to try to get those yellow lyre tails because I like the yellow with the blue and then it turns green. So yeah, these are Japanese blue endlers is what I started with. And um, that's what you're looking at here. Now it's odd that they're all just kind of sitting uh, so chill. <laughs> that's weird. I don't know what they're up to. So now that we've discussed uh, guppy genetics, guppy breeding, let's talk a little bit about um, some... Uh, Pelvochromus tineatus, uh, Maliwe, Maliwi. Uh, these guys are from adults that are, there's an adult in here somewhere. I don't know where he is, but he's big. He's like probably yay big. And so, wait, I'm confused. Uh, blurry eyed pandas. Uh, 106 says, I'm confused. Are endlers uh, liar tail guppies? I'm a beginner. Oh, so there are endlers with liar tails and there are guppies with liar tails. And it just depends on how they were bred. And I'm not sure, but I think that there's a good chance that they could have been bred with sword tails at some point. Because a lot of these fish interbreed but are sterile. So I don't know if we're talking a million years ago and there's some like pool of the genes, but I love the way they display with the, the liar tail, you get a lot more action because they've figured out that they can control those fins. And so as you see with this guy, uh, he is going all out. Now, another side note to mention about breeding animals is it's not just superstition. Um, no, they were bred to platies to get sword tails. Okay. That's cool. Um, yeah, if Betsy says that, then that may be totally the case. Uh, I have I don't know about that for sure. Um, so look it up, guys. I'll look it up when I'm off the, the cast because uh, on a lot of these things, I've tried to look up where it first came in and there's like a lot of debate. But the Fancy Guppy only showed up in 1961. And I actually uh, talked to a member of the Live Breeders Association and uh, one, like one of the um, people on the board type folks. And he said that in 1961 in uh, St. Louis, they had the first fancy guppy uh, that was officially like had a, as I call it, a flouncy tail, but it probably more like a Delta tail. There's names, there's like 20 names for tails when you get really into it. And I can go into that in another video because I used to breed guppies, but I don't even want to touch uh, all the names for the the dorsal fin up top and the um, all their side fins and their, uh, their belly shape versus their tail shape, all that stuff. It gets real crazy. Um, 
I'm in Surfer's Paradise, 10.45 a.m. Sunday, down in Australia. Well, good eye, mate. I hope you're doing well. That was awful. That was an awful. Water Wizard, what up? 2.45 a.m. Where are you at again? I forget. Is that London or France or Belgium or something? I'm trying to remember where you're at, Water Wizard. I could figure this out if I thought about it for a minute. Uh, 143. So he's farther east. Holland. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining from Holland. I love Holland. I want to go back. I've been there once. Uh, but, um, Netherlands, Copenhagen, Denmark, all that area, the southern, uh, or I guess central part of, I don't know what to call that. What do you call that? that culture, I guess. Uh, it's not quite Nordic, is it? Not Celtic. But in any case, I, uh, I have been to, um, let's see, I've been to Rotterdam, I've been to, um, Copenhagen, and I've been through, through Denmark. Uh, we went to this little hippie town called, uh, oh, what's it called? Loose, uh, shoot. I don't know. I'll remember it later. Uh, what I'm totally drawing a blank, but it's run by like uh, little hippies people and then some serious gangs. Oh, Rotterdam is where you live? Rad. Yeah, it's a beautiful city. Um, very cool. Um, and then I we cut through Belgium and stuff. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I've been around. Was trying to watch a movie, but I got a notification Alex was live. Movie is really hard to enjoy, so I'm here instead. Well, thank you. It's good to know that I can compete with a multi-million dollar blockbuster movie. Unless it was some, like, crappy movie. Um, in any case, let's talk about these little guys again real quick. Um, these are the Pelvic Acromus Tineatus, uh, um, Maliwes, and, uh, yeah, P hippie people do come in sizes. I don't know why I said that. I said little because they tried to, de they tried to declare it their own country. And I'm trying to remember, I can't for the life of me, remember the name of that town where like de facto weed and mushrooms and everything are, are like legal. I want to say it starts with an L or Christiana. That's what it is. Christi or Christiana, I think. Yeah. I don't know. I was high. I'm not gonna lie, uh, <laughs> I was younger, um, but yeah, it's a town that then got taken over by like Hell's Angels type bikers to control the drugs. But before it was like a hippie commune in the '60s and '70s, and it's like a walled city where they like have their own rules, and for some reason the government has left them alone. But yeah, so in this tank, it's I'm using it as a grow out tank, so I will turn on the. Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, power head. Sorry, I'm starting to lose my words, folks. Uh, I'll turn on the power head and that helps guppies, uh, helps a lot of fish grow out faster. Now, the other thing that helps fish grow out faster, and down here we've got, uh, Pelvica chromis bipindi. These are from Bentley Pasco. If you guys are on chats online, you probably have seen his name around. He lives right by me, him, Joel, uh, everybody, uh, you see on the Fish Fam channels, Bob Steenfot, we're all kind of in this area. So a lot of us are here. And then there's a couple in Indiana, in Ohio, St. Louis area. Seems to be the big hotbeds for the fish channels. Um, so I have some Daphnia here in a bottle. And they're just there short term because they will die in that bottle. But basically you strain them out. And so I feed all my grow outs live... Uh, cultures of either microworms or daphnia or whatever it is thanks for uh, reminding people to hit like uh betsy that is very nice of you uh i know it's a saturday night and you could be anywhere else but you're right here with me uh so in this tank uh also doing some grow outs of a different species of pelvic acromis. Uh, these are cribs they're getting old enough now to sex, and so that was a female just swimming by. And for them to breed, they're very different. So they're like plecos and things. So they're not mop breeders or egg scatterers. They have a den. And so you need to set up uh, either like 
a coconut like this and usually you bury the entrance to here and then the fish dig it out and they will do their mating dance all across here once they've paired up and then the female will retreat into here and the male will come and fertilize the eggs which she has laid on the roof in neat little rows which is kind of cool. So that's how cribs reproduce. That's how plecos reproduce. Plecos actually generally trap their mate in there. Uh, Sean Wilson, welcome, sir. Come on in. Uh, and then, so we've got egg scatterers. That was the mop. Then we've got the cave brooders. And then there's also mouth brooders. So then there's fish that uh, they'll lay eggs various ways, but... Basically, once they're hatched, they keep them in their mouth, and that's common in uh, the rift lakes uh, with certain cichlids and things like that. Um, so yeah, for me, I choose not to breed in sterile tanks that are just a tank with a power head and a filter, um, but the logic behind that is the baby fry can get sucked up by the filter. Here I've got um, filter floss at the intake, of the the hang off the back if it were on which it's not that's just bubbles from the uh the sponge filter and sponge filters or matten filters or whatever uh corner filters things like that are a lot better for fry um because they're not going to get sucked up and chewed up in the impeller or the the pump blades fan blades uh, so yeah, and what's interesting, we got a snail in the tubing there. Uh, earlier yesterday, even though I don't have any of the hang off the backs working right now, uh, I had uh, shrimp all up in there. And so they've been going in there to eat the old filter uh, detritus, and then they come out. So that's cool by me. This is where my misfit shrimp go. So like this guy wasn't blue enough for my taste. Uh, taking a break setting up a new rack tomorrow so i can do some breeding projects oh cool do you have any questions sean or anything to add because uh i don't know near any everything near anything uh about breeding and i always like people's input uh snails if you want to talk about breeding them just leave excess food out and they'll breed um this is a the best setup for breeding shrimp. We'll talk about that. This is for Neocaridina. So I keep the TDS around 300, 200 to 300, which is higher than you would for a Caridina. I don't keep any adult fish in here, although there is one exception, which is a baby. Uh, that is a baby from the king upstairs that Lucas sent with me, the endler. Uh, and so he's just chilling in there uh, because he's too small to do any damage uh, to the, the baby shrimp that are in here right now. Although if any new shrimp hatch, he will be moved. So this is a contentious subject. If you've been watching my channel, you know this, this uh, conundrum or issue already. And also, let me just mention that you see the food. I fed these guys last night. And the food's all moldy, not moldy, but like gooey and gross. So I like to feed them in trays. If you don't have snails or, or a good cleanup crew of some sort, uh, you want to feed them like on a tray if you can, a little glass dish or something. And a guy named David Hodge sent me some in the mail. So that was awesome. Uh, the viewer did that. And then another guy, Corey. Uh, who we showed off his Fahaka puffer fish and his dancing man shrimp in a short video a while back. Um, he also hooked me up with these glass ones. And I have to say, I do like the glass a little bit better because it doesn't discolor, doesn't scratch, and you can scrub it. But what I'll do a lot of times is I'll just take my vacuum uh, uh, gravel vac and I'll just suck that stuff right out of there in one squeeze of it and it's gone. So it looks like... Um, I use a canister filter with a sponge on the intake for my guppy endler shrimp tank, and it works pretty well. No babies get sucked in. Yeah, totally. I, I agree that that is another good way to go. Um, I have one, if you can see it, tucked back in there. Can we see it from this angle? Well, oh, you can see the reflection. 
So I have those intake sponges, but since none of my hang off the backs are running, I don't care right now, but I let them just become cultures because they're also great surface area for beneficial bacteria. Just need to get some tanks up and cycled. Had to relocate Beta for some angel fry. Ah, you're doing the angel fry. That is always an undertaking and can be some really good money, especially if no one else is doing it near you. Um, so... Uh, I don't know, I'm sure you know how to cycle tanks, but since that brings up something, if you're trying to, so say you have fish, they gave birth, and now you're like, what am I going to do with all these new fish? What I did here for these endlers is I went upstairs, I went to my 40 gallon, and I got 10 gallons of water out of the 40 gallons, dirty water. And I put it in here and then I dechlorinated another 10 gallons of tap water and put it in there. And then I grabbed some sticks and some rocks, bigger rocks that are porous, and I threw them in here. And the reason I keep sponges and filter intake sponges and things all over the place in all these tanks, I mean, that's not running either, um, those filters. Uh, this one is. But the reason I do that is so that I have a surface area that's already colonized by beneficial bacteria, and then I can start a new tank up and if I have to, as long as the tanks are all healthy and nobody has diseases, you can just siphon water out of a couple tanks. And that actually, for fry, uh, I like to have a tank sitting around that's just shrimp or just snails or whatever it may be, like a quarantine tank that's ready. Uh, because a lot of times you'll get things like planaria from extra food left over, or you'll get worms or like just funky little stuff. And that is all great for baby fish, for the most part. They, they can eat all that stuff. Not always the best for baby shrimp, like Hydra and Planaria. You guys can check out my older videos, though. Search for uh, Hydra, Planaria, Alphux. I've looked under the microscope at Hydra, which are like these creatures that are incredible. You can cut them in half, and they just turn into new ones. And they live forever. Like, they're, they're, they, their cells don't age, so something has to smash them in order for them to die. Um, like, smash them really thoroughly. So, in here, we have a red shrimp tank. These are also from Lucas Brett's. There's a, a buried up or pregnant female on this little Anubius Nana Petite uh, plant. Now, let me hop around the other side real quick. And I want to show you two things about shrimp breeding. So this is the contentious part of Mr. Alex's shrimp breeding. So if you look carefully here, you'll see I have a yellow Sakura shrimp in here. Come on, focus. Now this is a five gallon tank that will is a work in progress, but it is going to be devoted to uh it's going to be devoted to Devin, who is Betsy's past pup pal uh, that is no longer with us. And so this tank right now has a uh, shrimp because it arrived, basically must have gotten pregnant while <laughs> uh, Lucas sent it. Uh, so there's one yellow shrimp with all these red shrimps. And this is controversial in that people say never to... Um... Oh, okay, um... Let's see here. Understand at Betsy, just recovering from hip surgery. So I bit the bullet and I'm using a python. It takes an hour or so, but no lifting. Awesome, uh, Bob. That's cool. So I tried the python. I bought it and everything. It blew out the pressure. The back pressure blew out my friggin' pipe underneath my sink. And I had water spray everywhere. And... It would have been great. It works great on my hose outside. It uses the Venturi effect, which I will do probably a physics video on um, pumps, sumps, uh, suction, things like that. I think that would be an interesting video, um, but that's for another day. Uh, but yeah, so that sucks. But Bob, awesome. Those things are a lifesaver. I have herniated discs in my back plus inflammation, and so... Uh, <laughs> Basically, yeah, I've been doing little water changes with a two or, th or I think it's a three gallon, um, a three gallon little, uh, 
watering can and that has helped my back a lot instead of using the five gallons i mean it adds up i think each gallon's like eight or nine pounds i can't remember what it is exactly of water um but it adds up when i was doing like eight at once it was a bad idea um yeah uh betsy says she has her husband kevin who empties buckets yeah that's uh that's always nice when I use buckets, it's hard on this rack system because I can't tilt the bucket at the right angle with how close they are. They're, I think I decided on eight uh, or uh, 14 inches apart, but it's just enough that I can't get a Home Depot bucket at the right angle in there. But what I wanted to show you guys is, so this tank, it's relatively new. I got it, I think, two weekends ago. And, or a weekend ago, maybe. Is time flying fast? I don't know. Where am I? And so I have, uh, Betsy says, I have me, six dogs, they watch me do the python. Yeah, so the python, by the way, guys, if you don't know what that is, python is, uh, it's like a funnel that water, you turn your tap on, and that causes suction just as if you were sucking on a tube of a, of a, gravel vac or a hose to get a siphon going and it pulls water out of the tank and it can be like a hundred feet long and then you can flip it the other way and it'll just fill with it'll fill your tanks so you don't have to carry buckets back and forth it drains and fills your tanks um and it's very very cool when it works if you don't have an old house with crappy plumbing lines uh so what i wanted to point out here is if you're breeding shrimp this is a perfect time to mention this. So you see that split right there? These shrimp are in a new tank, and they're real happy about being in a new tank because now they're, they're not with fish. So some of these are my painted fire reds, and some of these are uh, Lucas's shrimp. And I talked to him a little bit and figured that the lineage is... Uh, the same end it's not from the chocolate end, the bloody mary end of things and so they won't make crazy weird shrimp uh together they'll continue to make red shrimp so his shrimp will increase the quality of my shrimp uh and he has won uh the shrimp cup uh best in show with his red shrimp so they're really good quality shrimp even the males look pretty good um and they're kind of spazzes. <laughs> These ones are pretty active. They're kind of funny to watch. Uh, but what I wanted to say was when you're shrimp breeding, you saw that crack in the back of the shell of that one shrimp. That's totally natural. Um, that's normal. And that happens because they are stretching. And you'll see shrimp once in a while. You'll see them like this guy uh, fold into an arch shape or the opposite into a U shape. And what that is, is they're trying to crack their shell in the center, their exoskeleton, which they shed and they shed that, which is mostly made of chitin. And, uh, they end up looking like little dead ghosts of shrimp. And so right here, I was going to tell you, you can tell the difference between a shed and a dead shrimp because a shed will have a crack or a split and a piece missing uh, right in the center of the back. So this shed here uh, has a split, as you can see, where the, the back would be. And if we find, where did that shrimp go? Uh, if we find the shrimp with the split in its back, because it's get, oh, right here, because it's getting ready to shed, that split is occurring right in the same spot because they stretch and then they, uh, wow, that, snail just parachuted in on their food dish uh, it's a black ram's horn snail uh, i'm also trying to breed them in this tank because they eat excess food even when it's gross but yeah so the other thing that happens when you have a tank with no fish and this is the water out of my tank that has a ton of fish is you will find that sometimes you'll get things like planaria you'll get things like hydra and as I said, see my past videos for Hydra. They are a terrifying little creature. They uh, have many heads and arms, and they sting your shrimp. And I know for a fact that that's why the shrimp are being little spazzes right here. There's got to be a Hydra nearby. 
And they don't necessarily capture or eat the babies, but they can harm their immune systems by constantly stinging them. And they're like little sea anemones, kind of, but they can jet off and move. And uh, clearly there's one in there somewhere. And after time, a system cycles out, and usually you'll be okay. But you could always throw an auto synclus in there, and they'll sometimes just eat everything off the walls. And... I, if I see a Hydra getting bigger than a quarter inch, I'll, I'll pull it out, uh, because ram's horns are great for cleaning tanks, so are scuds. Scuds are good, too. I have heard reports of people saying that scuds eat really, really young new baby shrimp. I haven't witnessed that, but I don't know. Look it up. Hydra are equivalent to freshwater sea anemones, but they grow asexually. Yeah, totally. Sh Sh Shaden 0040. Yeah, I have a video on them where I actually take them under the microscope and we watch them sting the crap out of some baby shrimp over and over again. Um, I feel like it should have had Benny Hill music playing, like because they just the dumb little shrimp would keep going back and getting stung. Um, but yeah, so that that happens. That's a thing. And uh, in fish world, that's okay. That's, that's natural to have all that stuff going on. But in the shrimp world, it makes it tough on the shrimp. Also, uh, the babies are easy to take care of, a lot of fry. I always keep some plants floating, even if they're not floating type. Uh, up here, we have a killifish breed. While I was talking about breeding this episode... So we have some, I don't have a problem with them, started with 20 shrimp in December and now have over 400. That is awesome, Soggy Pits. That is a good number of shrimp. The more you start with, the more you're going to get. Will fish eat hydra totally? Um, yeah, fish will eat planaria, hydra. Some people argue how much they eat planaria, but as long as you're not feeding them like rapashi every day and they're like spoiled, really well fed fish, you can just not feed them for a day or two and they will uh, eat a lot of the little buggers in your tank. But basically up here I have it dimmer because these guys live in the African rainforest in slow moving streams and they are rocket killifish and I have two males, three females up here and they've been laying eggs. And these guys are kind of egg scatterers in that they lay eggs but they lay them up on the surface on floating stuff so the female which right now one of them is back up in there um nerd boy aquatics what's up dude welcome come on in hit the like button as you enter the door please well actually as you exit because you don't know if you like what i'm saying i might be saying nerd boy sucks you don't i love you um but yeah so I've taken also some of the eggs from here and I put them down into the shrimp tank because the fry from killifish are so incredibly small. They're smaller than an apostrophe on a piece of paper. They're, they're as thin as an eyelash. And so they're just going to eat whatever's in the tank floating like algae and stuff. So that's why it's good to have some tanks with some algae and some ickiness in them. As long as the uh, ammonia and the nitrates and nitrites, all your water parameters are in order, uh, it's great. I like to have a, a tank that has nitrates of like 10 or 20 um, parts per million, which I know is uh, a little high. Um Got an elephant nose the other day and ended up with a free tiger endler score. Uh, Swag Skywalker, aka Nerd Boy Aquatics. Yeah, dude, awesome. I I I hate leopard and tiger endlers. Psh, I don't have ten tanks of them, <laughs> or four. Um, for new folks to the stream tonight, hit the like button. It helps more videos like this. Yeah, that's nice, Betsy. Thank you. Also, wanted to tell folks that Betsy is... So, until I can... Until we reach 10,000 viewers, I believe, I do not have features such as Super Chats. I can't ask for technical help from YouTube. And I can't do 
just weird stuff like email certain people or uh, respond certain ways and uh, affiliate link stuff isn't quite the same plus I don't know there's a bunch of features you can't do you can't do some of the in video editing and the like pop-up stuff uh, also some of the chat features are different so basically if and when I ever get to that I'm not that worried about it but then I will have more features. So the likes and things help. And when people uh, help out on Patreon, that really helps. But like for me, I only support Lucas and Rob on Patreon, honestly, because I don't have that much money. So uh, I use the money from this uh, rocks tanks. You've been lurking, trying to relax after a hard day's work and your tanks are helping. Keep going. Well, that is rad to hear. I appreciate that. I, I hope you're doing well. Also, click the bell icon to get notifications for all his videos and streams. Totally. So YouTube has redone a lot of what they're doing with their algorithms and their features. And one of the things they've done is made it so that when you subscribe, you don't actually get updates. You get a few of them tailored to what they think you might want to watch and tailored to what's going viral. If you want to see the thing you subscribe for, you have to go in manually on the right side of the subscribe button and click the bell if you want to get alerts for live streams and stuff more than just once in a while. And uh, that's kind of annoying to me, but I guess I see why they do it because a lot of people subscribe to dozens of channels and you don't want alerts all day long, so I understand that. But if this is a channel that you do enjoy, uh, I do appreciate it, and then you can just ignore me and, and tell me to go fly a kite if you don't want to watch that day. Um, also, I showed you guys this a little while ago, but I wanted to just show off. This is just Java Moss, and it is growing awesome in the cracks of of this one rock i don't know why this rock uh but basically every little crack has started to uh take the spores of this underwater moss and it's growing on it and i really like that so i hope it continues to grow and then feather out from there um but yeah, that's what happens. Also, look at this big bruiser of a pel pelvic acromus pulcher. So I have four species of cribs. Uh, this one has uh, Popeye, came in with Popeye, uh, maybe Dropsy, I don't know. But yeah, oh yeah, and I don't have moderators until 10,000. So that's why uh, 10,000 subscribers until then, listen to what Betsy says. She's my de facto moderator. And if she tries to uh, have a coup or something, obviously, I'll let y'all know. But until then, <laughs> uh, listen to what Betsy says if she's got uh, something or posts a link for me. Uh, she's been sweet enough to uh, volunteer to help me out in that way. Um, oh, uh, yeah, I don't sleep well either. So I've actually thought about once in a while. I don't want to, like, quote-unquote, cheapen my channel. So, uh, it's hard, but, uh, like Betsy and I talk a lot in the middle of the night because neither one of us can sleep. We both have, uh, issues with pain and stuff like that. And so, uh, Facebook messenger, um, you can always hit me up on that. Like, especially this channel, uh, you know, we're about to hit 1500, but it's not super crazy unmanageable. I feel like I can talk to all y'all and don't feel afraid to contact me. Everybody who has, uh, I've chatted up. Um, there's a Facebook group that I'll try to post the link to afterwards, after the end of the video. But you can also search for it. It's just called This Secret History Living in Your Fish Tank or Your Aquarium, I guess, uh, on, on uh, Facebook. And you'll see, like, I don't know, 60 people in there or something like that. Uh, but, yeah, so... That's all stuff going on with breeding. Um, trying to think what else... I want to mention today. I think that's a good place to just kind of, uh, we talked about, uh, if you want to breed endlers and guppies, we talked about let's, so let's end this talking about, uh, egg scatterers like, t uh, tetras and things like that. Um, 
awesome uh, Swag Skywalker Nerd Boy Aquatics. Man, that's a mouthful, just like my channel. Um, I'll check out, if you have a channel, I'll check it out too. Like whenever I see someone who has a name that looks like that might be a channel, I, I try to go check it out. And honestly, I don't subscribe to everything right away, but then I will later. Um, like if I see more videos that I dig, um, I, I will subscribe to my subscribers. Um, awesome. I'll check it out, nerd boy. Mm. So, I was going to say, critters like all these tetra species. I've got five tetra species in here. we got neon blacks, neon greens, uh, rummy nose, lemon eye, ember. Maybe we have six species of tetras. But to breed those, what you do is you would take something... Hold on. Bear with me. Yeah. Something along the lines of, Betsy, what are these called? These knitting uh, crochet pattern sheet things you get at Joanne's Fabric or Michael's or Hobby Lobby or whatever, Amazon. You get these or a screen of some sort that has holes that are pretty small, needlepoint plastic, that's what it's called. And you lay that mid-layer in the tank. And then... Uh, tetras and things like that they literally just like spout eggs everywhere yeah it's a plastic mesh that's really fine that's all it is it's cheap it's like a buck for that so um, it works better because since they're square it works better in like a 20 gallon breeder you can get like two of them and either hot glue them in or whatever if you're interested in it you can also use a colander as long as the adults don't fit through but basically, you plant the bottom with, like, um, I don't know, let's say water sprite or java moss or something that's just pretty dense that you can get pretty dense, hornwort, whatever, pearlweed. And you pl dense, plant that densely. This would probably work. I don't know. It might need a little more planting. But then you'd put that layer here and you keep the adults up here. And they just like like rabbits, like every night right now, they are making babies and they're dropping eggs and then the male will fertilize the little cloud of eggs and then it all falls down onto the bottom. And what's happening now is they're eating the eggs before they can ever grow up. And so that's why I don't have any babies in this tank. But I have seen people with tanks that are so densely planted that they get even like neon tetras and things like that to have babies. Uh, somebody asked earlier why my uh, CO2 thing is right in the center of my tank right now. Uh, it's because no one's coming over and basically there is a little power head. And so I like to change where the CO2 is. Um, CO2 uh, at this this style of output, basically it 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 stays in the water as a gas, but to work itself into the water column well, it needs to uh, hit the surface and break up even smaller and dissolve into or hit something in the tank, hit water flow, whatever it may be, and then that leaves the carbon in the tank. Um, the C from CO2 and then the oxygen the O2 can also dissolve into the water and then as it comes down through this system back here whether you have a hang off the back or uh, an inline filter whatever it may be a canister filter uh, that then the exchange of gases happens when the surface uh, when the surface uh, tension is broken and uh, that's the best way to do it. What are you using to carpet your non-CO2 tanks? Um, well, so this is my only CO2 tank at the moment, although I do have the ability now to put CO2 in much many more tanks. Uh, yeah, totally, Betsy. Betsy has it right. What do I do to carpet my tanks? Uh, I plant a ton of stuff. I like this one here, not high-tech. Uh... I take crypts and I plant them and then I cut them in half and then I plant them next to them and then I take a you know, temple plant and I cut the top off that and then I put it right there. So this was twice as tall last week and then I put it there. Um, 
that's basically what I do. Here's some hydrocotyl, uh, little four leaf clover type stuff. Uh, this is Rotala rotundifolia and Rotala indica Vietnam, I want to say. And then, uh, yeah, so I just replant over and over and over. There's some boosts back in there, some uh, green ghost brownie, I want to say, something like that. Um, there's so many silly names for boosts, I can't keep them straight. And here's another piece that just broke off and is like started there. Sometimes uh, aquariums do better when you don't monkey with everything. I monkey a lot. And, uh, oh, for shrimp tanks, I recommend using... Uh, I mean, having a good wad of Sawasertong. So Sawasertong uh, is always a good idea. I've got a wad of it back there. I like to put katapa leaves, Sawasertong, rock piles. Also, I have a whole video on that. That they're more comfortable in than plants even. And uh, basically for baby shrimp, uh, get some substrate. Even if you're using like Brightwell or something that buffers, you can always put that in a jar like this and it will diffuse into the water and lower that uh, pH. And then you can make the substrate whatever you want. And sand works fine, uh, like blasting sand or pool filter sand. You can get both those pretty cheap at like Home Depot or uh, supply stores like that. Uh, but I like to have basically uh, gravel of different sizes mixed with sand so you can see there's layers and the sand will settle and it'll kick up and it'll do weird stuff and it'll compact uh, so you got to be a little careful that you don't have like a ton of sand and then like it it makes anaerobic bacteria that creates sulfur pockets um, but yeah totally listen to Betsy uh, choya wood and uh, driftwood things like that are good too um, for them, but I do think that they like comfortable wise, low to the ground, dense plants, but really take your pick. The other thing that they like is like water sprite or um, at the top you can use anything with roots. So red root floaters, salvinia, water, lettuce, um, duck, uh, what's it called? Duckweed, uh, any of the, or no, not duckweed. It doesn't have good. I mean, you could use it, but it's really just for sucking up nitrates and contaminating other t other things. Frog bit. Thank you, uh, Shadden. That was what I was thinking. Uh, yeah. And uh, basically, I would do that. I would use a combination of substrates. And if your pH is fine in your water, then don't worry about it. I add either cuttlefish bone or uh, the calcium part and uh, I add broken eggshells that have been boiled into my hang off the back filters. And so I boil it so that they don't have any nasty bacteria and then I tuck them under my filter floss and bacteria grows on the eggshells which have protein still stuck to them like the thin layer. And then because of that, uh, that protein and those little teeny things uh, basically um, it contains more calcium then. And so then your shrimp will eat that in the alfux. And so alfux are the slimy texture you feel on surfaces in your, in your tank. Um, you could also plant flame moss, which grows straight up. Um, you know, Java moss is kind of, it can be lame. It can be great. It's just, it kind of depends on it. I could see why, Lucas doesn't like it, but like I showed you earlier on that rock, it's hugging that rock really well and looks really cool. Um, but that's just done that on its own. I couldn't have done that if I tried. Um, Alfux can help promote infusoria. Also great food, totally. Um, let's see here. What else is a good carpeting plant for a low-tech shrimp tank? Um, let's see here. Um... In here, I mean, some of this stuff, most of this stuff will grow. It'll just grow slower. But, like, the hydrocodal has started to grow really well in this due to the CO2. But it will grow. Ludwigia will will grow. Um, I got most of this blood red Ludwigia. And actually, what the heck is going on? Let me turn this on really quick. 
I've been going at half power all day. There we go. So, if you notice, there's some blood red uh, Ludwigia in here and Temple Plant also. Uh, and then there's also Lucustris, uh, Ludwigia ex Lucustris um, and all sorts of stuff. But all that stuff, pretty much all this stuff would be good for shrimp. They like it, but I wouldn't get something like like this water wisteria, which has a bunch of algae on it. I'm probably going to just rip that out. Um, basically, that's too wide for the shrimp, but it does take out a lot of nitrates and stuff, so that's good. Pearlweed, that's what Lucas uses, and I really do recommend pearlweed. Um, so, yeah, but all, all my tanks I try to keep really planted. And I, I will hit people up at swap meets and at our club and stuff like that. And I'll, I'll be like, hey, you guys want to trade like a clipping this big? And they'll just be, oh, I'll just give you that, man. Don't worry about it. Off of a piece that's up for sale or something. And then I take it home and I baby it and grow it into something like this. And then I chop it and propagate it. So, yeah. Something else interesting going on here regarding uh fish breeding so you got guppies and endlers all males together here and the biggest guppy male is getting hit on by the baby and or by the small endlers they're adult endlers but they're getting hit on uh off and on and getting displays put on and i think that they're assuming if, i don't know if it's a dominance thing or what but uh, hair grass, dwarf hair grass is really hard unless you have CO2 from my experience. Uh, cypress, uh, hellfairy or hellfry, that's another one you can use, but also hit and miss. Usually I'll get a clump to grow and that's it. If you go buy it like in a culture, uh, size, I would like cut it into three pieces for a best chance of survival. Unless you have a, a good, uh, fertilized soil tank, it's just not the best plant for you pearlweed is seriously an amazing carpenter um and that's what lucas really likes too and he's really good at raising shrimp so i i think he's onto something uh for me i have pearlweed living in here but i also have a lot of other stuff also the other tank obviously that we were that i've shown you a couple times now this one is even more crazy selection of stuff. This is my bigger plant tank usually. But hornwort, um, that in a low light will grow. Um, if it's high light, it'll grow denser. But in low light, it'll reach and it'll grow real fast. And then you can just float it at the top. And shrimp like to hang out. Like all the times I see shrimp up here in this tank. Wood is great. Uh, the shrimp also eat a lot of alfux and uh, little colonies off the, the wood. Um, kabamba can be good. I've used that with shrimp before, but I keep it very short. Um, Bob Kaler, increasing your plants in anticipation of your puffers next week. Puffers? What kind of puffers are you getting? Uh, that's cool. What about any wart plants except bladderwort? Yeah, hornwort, good. Uh, pellias are great. Uh, you know, um, Suswassertongue and all the variations of it. So let me show you what a CO2, um, Fissidens, usually you want CO2 with, um, same with Rikia. Uh, but this is a Suswassertang pellia, actually, uh, growing in co2 and it just looks like a mat of hair uh yeah it's spelled like subwasser tongue but that b actually check that video out that's a pretty interesting one if i do so so say so myself if you go back and watch my video on suswasser tongue uh i talk about how it was discovered how we're still arguing over if it's a pelia or a fern it's a gamophyte of a fern which means it's like the the baby underwater stage but it is yeah it it's it's a weird thing and it lives forever like its cells don't die of old age uh so that's kind of a cool little story and also a lot of scientists have argued over that i thought i'd close this session uh by just feeding some fish and thanking y'all for joining me
Uh, I appreciate it greatly. You guys watching, liking, subscribing, all that stuff keeps me going, makes me happy. Uh, yeah, it's a German word uh, that, yeah, the, the B symbol, it, I talk about that in the, in the video too. So it's actually Suswassertang. And the W is a Wasser sound, rather than Wasser. Um, but yeah, so this tank, uh, it's thinned out a little. I've moved stuff around. So this tank isn't as crowded as it used to be. Um, well, thank you for watching, Bob. I appreciate that. And I appreciate everyone who is here. Also, uh, you can see this is a low-tech tank, but I keep it well-stocked. And... Uh, yeah, some people grow so Swassertong like by the bucket. Other people don't grow it very well at all. Um, I wanted to mention you saw how like completely covered the front of this tank was in really hard um, diatome algae a, a while back, but uh, the nearite snails finally uh, started doing their job, what I pay them for, and. Uh, have been eating it's mesmerizing to watch their little scraping pads their their buck teeth as it appears to be but it's actually a bony pad uh that's another little interesting thing that we could talk about in another video i've touched touched on a lot of subjects today that we could do whole videos or live streams about but um basically teeth for all animals evolve from scales so like our teeth came from when shark scales became their teeth. And uh, basically, fish teeth are ev evolved uh, tooth tongue called a radula. That is totally correct. Um, and yeah, they're kind of interesting. It allows them to put a lot of force down into uh, a direction without hurting their teeth. And actually, a lot of different species have to exert pressure on that. Um, or they have a hard time uh, with them growing too big. Uh, yeah, welcome New England. Uh, S. Oaks, thank you for watching. I'm glad you enjoyed the live stream. If you're just watching, you could always watch the replay. New England Endler, do you have any questions? Uh, I'll answer one more question if you have any. But other than that, watch the replay if you'd like. Um, also wanted to say that if y'all are buying any sort of, and you can see some fish going at it mating right now, male and female chasing each other around of the, the pulcher, and pulcher means beautiful in Latin. Um, but yeah, they're chasing each other around in there. Uh, so, uh, buck teeth, I'm still rolling. <laughs> yeah, these... Uh, the pelvochromus pulchers are funny to watch. They, like, play in here. They need a cave, usually, but if they don't have an, a real cave, like, sticks and, and caves like this kind of, like, cracks will work. But you can tell when they're getting uh, ready for sexy time because they uh, color up, like, bright yellow and red and stuff. And these two are, uh, like, going around in, like, little figure eights, uh, chasing each other it's kind of funny there's two females and a male in that group um but i always find it fascinating to watch fish and right now those two females are trying to show off for the male and one is trying to get um the the special treatment alex i hope you can use the thought i mentioned on the last video for a topic which one was that sorry bob i, f I forgot already i'll have like um, but yeah, the whole teeth from scale things I'd like to, to do a video on. Um, I just did a video on the thing we talked about with the shrimp shedding versus a dead shrimp, what the difference looks like. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, I'll make, oh, thank you so much, Betsy. Wow, that would be great, because I forget, uh, oh, fish having feeling emotions. Yeah, so... That almost, Betsy and I were talking earlier before the live chat, and we almost talked about ethics and morality, like wild caught versus uh, domestic raised, and just like what is animal cruelty versus keeping fish in an awesome habitat when in the wild they die really young a lot of times. Um, 
we were just kind of talking about that. Um, same thing as their dentine. They're called denticles. Shadden, you are just full of great words right now. I don't have, like, I can't look up these things right this uh, second, but um, basically, yeah. Michael's rant yesterday on Michael's fish tanks gave me the idea. I'll have to check that out. I didn't see that video. Um, but I want to do, I want to team up with someone. Also, I was going to tell you guys, if you need plants or shrimp, a lot of the stuff I've been showing in my tanks recently has come from, uh, aquatic arts and I got them to give us a 10% discount. If you do secret shrimp 10, all in caps, 10, uh, as the numbers, you'll get 10% off your order, right? off your entire order, uh, as many, I think it's as many times as you want, I'm not sure, but, uh, because I featured some of their stuff, uh, that gets passed on to you guys, so if you were going to buy something online, uh, that helps me, it helps them, and you can save 10%, their prices are pretty fair compared to most online places, so just wanted to throw that out there again, that you can save 10% with the, the coupon code secret shrimp 10 um, you can save 10%, so, yeah, all right, guys, well, um, how's the blue dreams, or did you miss it, okay, so, I will go downstairs, oh, what a journey, and, uh, yeah, we project our emotions onto our animals, and give, we anthropomorphize them, and pretend like fish are in love, and fish are this and that, and, and, uh, they're not humans. They don't feel like humans. They feel like fish. Who knows? Maybe they feel more than us. Maybe they feel nothing. I don't know. Actually, I do know a little bit. But um, I was going to be done, but I can't say no to you people. Um, so here are the blue dreams that are from Lucas. Now, what I'm debating is... Some of them are lower grade. Like, most of his shrimp look really good. Like, that male back there is really blue, nice looking. This one eh, is pretty translucent and dull. But supposedly, these genetics are all really good. So when we're talking genetics like we were earlier, uh, sometimes you can't just judge books by their cover. Males are a lot lighter color. And with a lot of species, they have sexual dimorphism, which means there's a difference between males and females. And uh, sometimes you can have a really dull, lame-looking uh, shrimp that's a male, but it has the genes to have beautiful blue babies. Um like this female here. So I don't know. I don't want to like throw it out yet, but if I see that there's some pattern in shrimp not being quite as good as the ones he sent, then I can always uh, remedy that. But I don't mind having some that are like slightly translucent or whatever. It's getting pretty nitpicky that I'm like saying that's not a good quality shrimp. <laughs> uh, it's still a fine shrimp. Same with this one. Also, they change color based on their substrate. So if I put them on all black substrate, they would change color more. Um, what is that? There's a, sorry, I'm trying to figure out what is next to that shrimp that made it jump. Um, but that one I, I'm hoping is about to be pregnant. Um, with the way her belly's gotten big. Uh, but I was looking for my Babalti shrimp that I got from aquaticarts.com because they're really cool. They're really temperamental to ship, I have learned, just through uh, this process. But, uh, oh, by the way, there's Siswasertong um, right there. Also, I take all my dead um, snail shells and I throw them in here. Uh, in my shrimp tanks, and I allow algae to grow, because shrimp like algae, they like alfox, they like uh, bacteria, all that stuff is just more stuff for them to eat off of, also these moss balls are good, they, they trap algae and bacteria, they are algae, and uh, yeah, so those are good, um, just because, why not, let's try moving this catapa leaf, and uh, Shrimps like it dirty. That's right. Um, yeah, there goes the shrimps flying. Whee! Um, but yeah, so then here is a rock pile built 
uh, the way I've discussed in other videos. So you'll see that there's pebbles underneath there and then they get to this size and then I put capstones over them. So that is how I deal with that. Have you ever had brackish tank and done a talk on them? I have had a brackish tank with guppies um, and no, I have not done a talk on it, but that's something I could probably do. I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself an expert. I would have to be speaking from a real didn't do the best job in the world point of view on it. Um, yeah, but yeah, so these are the blues from, from, uh, Lucas Brett's LRB Aquatics and, uh, they're doing well. They're growing. Um, some of them, most of them they, he sent were like quarter inch to half inch. And so they're not quite, uh, sexually mature, but, um, like that one there is the one that I'm trying to figure out, uh, S Oaks. Do I keep it in the tank or do I put it up in the misfits tank? Like, does it have the magic genes or is it translucent and lame? Cause you just don't know. Sometimes the males that are translucent like that, uh, produce really great offspring because it's recessive genes or whatnot. They express themselves differently along the X and Y chromosome. Here was one that I didn't deem worthy because it has a black spot on its head and some banding going on on its back, but uh, also not a bad blue shrimp. It's just it wasn't up to Lucas's world's greatest, world's truest blue shrimp line. So he has the line that produces uh, good quality blue shrimp more often than any any other line. And he's won awards at the Aquatic experience as well as at um the what's it called uh shrimp the chicago shrimp show <sighs> okay guys well i think into a blue tiger yeah uh i guess it would be a, a riley tigers are a caradina strain and that was a neo caradina um but i could try to do a riley shrimp if we keep breeding it with other ones like that, you can. What size were those bigger tanks? Those are just 20 longs. They're a good size. Um, 20 longs and 10s and a 5 is what I have there. Um, and I like the 20 longs. I've found you can keep as many fish in a 20 long as you can in a 30 breeder easily. And almost as much, well not quite, but as a 40 because... You've got so much surface area that if you change the water out whenever it needs it, you have a biological filter that is incredible. That and they've got like feet of swimming room. Um, so there's a lot of room for them to swim. Now, if you have fish that need to go up and down a lot, which honestly there aren't a ton that like that is a must have, like a discus, sorry, or an angel, that would be the case. But guppies no i mean plecos no uh so i i highly recommend that uh those that tank size so i've gone long because i can't shut up <laughs> and you guys have stuck with me i appreciate that but uh i wanted to thank you guys i want you guys to take care of yourselves take care of your tanks and uh swim on i don't know it's kind of a cheesy phrase but uh I don't know. Keep at what you're doing. Keep trying. Keep working through the things that are hard. And uh, good night, fish fam. I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, go back and check out some of those videos that I mentioned. If people check out the videos from like January and February, uh, when I was putting out a video a day, and I was actually, I didn't have any work at that time for a month. And so I work night and day on some videos doing a lot of good research and stuff. So some of those, ignore. you can ignore some of the shrimp videos, but there's some shrimp genetics and stuff that I later made another video to. And so people are seeing the first one and I don't have, didn't have the heart to delete it because it wasn't totally inaccurate. It was just one part of the story and certain shrimp have come from like, like blue shrimp have been created three different ways genetically. And so it's not, wrong to say that they came from one way but it it was incorrect to assume that was the only way so all right say good night 
Good night, guys. I'll talk to you later. Uh, take care. Bye-bye! How do I turn this off?